Hey guys, this is a quick video about bonding and grounding. And the reason I'm doing this is a couple of reasons. If you're on the hazmat team, or if you end up being stationed at Hall 7, you have to know about bonding and grounding for transferring liquids. We do this with diesel all the time. We might eventually do it with gasoline and other, other flammable uh, liquids. Now you might be saying to yourself, what if I'm not at Hall 7? What if I'm not a hazmat tech? Well, even if you're an ops guy sitting at Hall 6, if you guys have a hazmat call and we as a hazmat team come out and end up transferring product, as you'll see, it's a pretty big operation. So you'll need to know this stuff in order to be able to help out. And you'll need to know this stuff in order to provide some oversight or reminders. Hey, guys, shouldn't we be bonding and grounding this? Or shouldn't you be using the mega meter? Shouldn't you be using the ohm meter? We'll go through all this. This way you'll know, we'll know, and hopefully we can all keep an eye on each other. So bonding and grounding, we do it for a couple of different reasons. First and foremost is to keep us safe. We don't want it to go boom. This has happened in the past in Delta, in the States. We don't want it to happen again. Secondly, we don't want to get sued by WCB, either as a fire department, as a corporation, or individually. You don't want to omit this step if you're transferring certain classes of liquids. Third of all, we don't want to take a bad situation and make it worse. So that's why we're bonding and grounding. Basically, if we've got a container, and we've got a second container, and this could be a damaged gasoline tanker pumping off into an undamaged gasoline tanker. This could be a big 45-gallon drum of toluene being poured into a bucket, like what happened in Delta. If we're transferring liquid, it's a little bit like shuffling your feet on the carpet. You can build up a static charge. You do build up a static charge. The transferring of the liquid, the shuffling of the feet on the carpet, we're going to build up a charge. Say it's a flammable liquid. I come up, I touch, I, I touch the container, I touch the liquid, I get a spark. That spark is easily enough to ignite that liquid. Right? It's an ignition source. So we've got to get rid of this trapped electricity on the surface of the vessel. There's a couple different ways that we do this. The first is by bonding. That's taking this container and this container and bonding them together. That makes them at the same charge. So now, if we're transferring liquid, we're not building up a charge relative to those two containers. The second thing we do is take both of them and we hook them into a grounding field. This is grounding. This way, we take whatever charge is there and we put it into the ground. If we hook everything up to the ground, everything's at the same potential, you don't get a spark. At the airport, by the way, when the fuel truck comes out to fuel the airplane, all they do is bond. And then when the truck comes back to the refueling station, then they ground it. So sometimes in the real world, you'll only see bonding, you'll only see grounding. We're going to do both. There's three parts of this talk. The first is how to build a grounding field, how to build this thing. The second part is how to test that grounding field, how to make sure that that's actually doing the job that you think it's doing. And the third is how to hook this all together. And once you've hooked it all together, and you've given it some time to dissipate the charge, and for a big rail car full of something like hexane, that could take a couple of hours. If it's a different liquid in a smaller vessel, it might only take a little bit of time. The bottom line is, if you think you or somebody else is going to be transferring, you want to hook up a bonding and grounding system as fast as possible and give it the maximum amount of time to uh, dissipate the charge. That's called relaxation time. So the question comes up, when should you bond and ground? Well, 100% for sure when you're doing flammables or combustibles. If we're transferring diesel or gasoline, you've got to take care of that static charge. If you don't, first, first of all, it could flash. Second of all, WCB could have your ass and the department's ass. But a lot of contractors, a lot of companies say bond and ground everything. If you're transferring a non-flammable acid from here to there, bond and ground it. And it makes a certain amount of sense because it's an emergency situation. If it wasn't an emergency, we wouldn't be there. We don't know 100% for sure that nobody mixed something in with that acid that could flash. We, a, a container is damaged. We don't know exactly what would happen if it, if it sparks. So my recommendation is that we bond and ground everything every time we, we uh, transfer liquids. So. The first way 
that we see a lot for grounding, building a grounding field, is your basic copper rod. Now if you take this and you pound it into the ground, a lot of people think their job's done. As you'll see in a bit, maybe that's not the case. Brian, could you give me a hand here, please? So, we've got a copper rod. I'm gonna bang it down into the ground. So a lot of people think that we're done. We've pounded this in. Really, how much of this rod is touching the ground though? There's not a lot of surface area there, and it's pounded in a foot, maybe a foot and a half. So when we test this, we'll find that this really doesn't have very much connection to the ground, or there's a lot of resistance between this rod and the ground. Another thing to consider is if there's a gas line, or an electrical cable, or a fiber optic cable, or you know, a sewage main, we could be doing a lot of damage. You put a hole through a fiber optic cable, we're talking millions of dollars worth of damage. Put, a, put it into a gas line, obviously we have other problems. So it's not a very good connection to the ground, and uh, we run into the problem of puncturing things or destroying things. And it's also, if we pound this in deep enough, go ahead, keep pounding it, please. Then we end up with a problem of getting it back out. It can be a real pain in the butt to get these out of the ground if they're deep in. Okay, so let's say that this is an eight foot rod and we've sunk four feet of it into the ground. To pull this out by hand, really, really difficult. Here's a trick that does work. If you've decided to go with this method, tight set of ice grips, That will often get it back out of the ground. Let's go on to the next method of building a grounding field. So here's a way that we can improve a grounding field. We've got one four foot rod, let's say it's buried all the way into the ground. We carry a second four foot rod on the truck. So you put it four feet away, there. And then you pound that into the ground too. Go ahead, Brian. Okay, so we've got two rods that are buried in the ground all the way. And if it's a four foot rod, you have them four feet apart. If it's an eight foot rod, you have them eight feet apart. Then you connect them up. Here. And here. Now, you're gonna test the connection between here and here, and here and here later. But as long as the connection is good, you're basically increasing the size of your field. If you're in a dry area, like a sandy or a gravelly area where the resistance to the ground is real high, then you might go as many as three or four rods. And when we were doing this in the desert in Colorado, we had to do three rods and we had to wet the area down to get any kind of good connection to the ground at all. Okay, so we've wisely decided that we don't want to bury them in the ground vertically. We're worried about taking out that fiber optic cable. The other option, put them flat on the ground, in the ground. So you can either do one or you can do two. Again, four feet apart. You dig a narrow trench, you put them in, you leave one end exposed, you put the rod in, you pound it shut, you put some water on top of it to make a good connection between the earth and the rod, and then you've got a horizontal grounding rod field. Okay, so now we've got the two rods in the earth. The disadvantage here is that you're not going as deep. With the vertical rod method, you might be getting down to groundwater, better connection, less resistance with the soil. Here, you're shallower, you avoid a bunch of problems, easier to get the rods out. 
but we are probably gonna have to wet it down with water or salty water to make a good connection. If you come and take a look here, we, what we've done is we've left the ends exposed so that we can clamp a couple of them together. So here's another method to build a grounding field when you're out in the field. Your handy bonding and grounding kit, in addition to the instructions, you've also got a couple rolls of aluminum foil. Basically, aluminum foil has got a lot more surface area than a copper rod. So what Brian and I are going to do, we're going to dig a shallow grave, probably longer than you think it needs to be, and we'll line it with aluminum foil. Then we'll put the uh, soil back down, we'll wet it, we'll put the soil back down on top of it, and then we'll have a pretty good grounding field, hopefully. We're going to test them later in the next part of the video. Now we're going to cover it back up, hold the aluminum foil in place. We're going to leave a bit of it exposed at the end where we can wad it up and clamp onto it later. Remember, we're going to test all this. If it looks a bit hokey, that's okay, so long as it works, and we'll be able to get the numbers as to whether or not it works in a second. So once again, we've left access here at the end. We can wad this together, there's tons of contact. And here is where we'll clamp onto later when we're actually setting up the whole thing. Okay, so now we've got a ground field set up. We want to see if it's any good. For that we use this thing called a megameter. Basically what it does is it dumps a charge into the soil and sees how much resistance there is in the soil to that charge going through it. The more resistance, the worse your field is. Ideally, you want very, very low resistance. That way, any charge you put in the soil can dissipate really easily and really fast. So, if we look at what's in here, we've got the actual unit and we've got three sets of leads. There's a really long red lead that's going to go far away. I think it's about 50 feet. And then there's a fairly long lead. This is 62% as long as the red one got to go in the same direction. So we'll run the red out, we'll run the yellow out, we'll keep the mega really close to whatever we want to test, and then we're going to use the green lead to tie in to the rod to test it. So two things. First of all, don't touch it. You could get shocked. And really importantly, forgetting about getting shocked, don't leave this hooked up when you're actually doing the transferring. You don't want to be putting charge into the system when you're transferring it. So. When you're testing it, you leave it hooked up. When you're done testing, you unhook it. Obviously, the cable's got two different ends. One end goes into the machine, red to red, yellow to yellow, green to green. The other end goes into this spike. This is the spike that's gonna get run out. Brian, could you take that out to the far, please? So we've done all that with a mega turned to the off position. We're going to clip into our, uh, our field here. We're going to test one pole to start with. There's one pole by itself, not connected to the other pole, but most of it is buried in the ground. So that's, that's pretty good to start with. So what we've done here is we've tied our mega into our ground system. We just want to make sure that that's a good connection though, right? Maybe I clipped into a bit of a rusted cable or there's some tape on there or something. I'm going to use my ohm meter set to ohms of resistance up here. Right now it's reading 0.L, which for some strange reason means infinite resistance. There is essentially no conductivity between these two probes. I'm going to check from the black uh, from the metal here on the green cable 
to the copper rod. I'm getting less than 10 ohms of resistance. I even got as low as... Zero point zero to two point eight. For the ohm meter, less than ten ohms of resistance is acceptable. What we're going to do is we're going to turn it from off to the three P thing. That means we're using three uh, points of connection. We've got the two pins out there, and we're connected to the pole. I'm going to push the test button. It blinks for a while and it's going to give us a reading. 436 ohms. That's pretty high. I'll tell you what the standards are in a minute. You can see that we also have a choice of 50 volts or 25 volts. Basically, we're always going to be using 50 volts. The 25 volts was something, literally, so farmers in Britain wouldn't shock their cows when they were doing this. We're going to test it again, see if we get a different value. Four hundred thirty-six ohms. So we had four hundred thirty-six ohms on a single rod. We're going to connect up to the other rod here. We're going to put it to three P for three points of connection. We're going to hit test. It's blinking. Two hundred and eighty-one ohms. So you see that using the two rods has improved our grounding field. Ideally, we want to get down to twenty-five ohms. So I'm going to try wetting these with salted water, and we'll see if it makes a better connection between the rods and the soil. I've got a five-gallon bucket of water and regular old table salt. You can use Gatorade, urine, any kind of electrolytes would help, and you use about half of the. Uh, container of salt. Proofs in the pudding, right? Whether if it, if it drops the resistance, then it's working. The thing to remember with this is if you're there for a long time, you might need to re-wet your grounding field in order for it to stay hydrated because it's going to dry out as time goes on. Okay, so that's salty water. Probably could use a bit more salt. I'm going to pour it along where the rods are buried. We've got both rods hooked up. We got the salt water in. We'll retest it. One hundred and forty-four ohms. So we basically just cut it in half again. So let's try this again. This time with the aluminum foil method. We haven't yet improved the grounding field by adding salt water. That'll come next if we need it. We're going to clamp on the aluminum foil where it's wadded up. I'm going to use my ohm meter set to ohms just to make sure that I've connected properly into the aluminum foil. And I've got zero ohms of resistance there, so I'm cool. I'm going to hit test. The wires are run out all the way. The red is run out as far as it can. The yellow is run out as far as it can in a straight line. And I'm getting 119 ohms of resistance, which is better than the two-pole method, better than the wetted two-pole method. Let's wet this down with salted water and see what we get. Once again, we have it set for 50 volts. The 25 volt setting is a specialty setting. We don't need it. We're now down to 97. 0.7 ohms, which is the best reading we've got so far. So with the aluminum foil method and one bucket of salty water, we got it down to 97.7. What's the ideal number? Unfortunately, there's not a real clear guideline. The U.S. National Electrical Code says it should be 25 ohms or less. I believe that's dealing with houses. Hopefully we're dealing with less current than that. The petrochemical industry, Petro-Canada, says less than 10 ohms. 
So we're not quite there yet. The real answer is as low as possible. That's when I've talked to people, they've said, get it as low as possible. They have not given me a firm answer. Presumably, if you can't get it real low, you gotta pump slower so that your static buildup is less and it takes longer to accumulate and you've got more time to get rid of it. Let's see what we can do if we add a couple more buckets of water to wet this down. Keeping in mind that if this is what's stopping our entire operation from blowing up, we better keep on wetting this down as the whole operation goes on. Okay, so we've used three buckets of water now and the aluminum foil method, but we are in Tilbury. It's sandy and gravelly here. There's a thin layer of topsoil, but in terms of the current traveling deep below the ground, it's pretty dry, it's pretty crappy. So let's see what we got it down to. eighty four point five ohms so that's not fantastic but it's a heck of a lot better than nothing as a lot better than one pole which was partially plunked in the ground you know if you had a foot of that a four inch pole stuck in the ground no what not wetted down sort of the way that you see other other departments doing it you'd be lucky if you get 500 ohms so we've made a big improvement here it's a lot better than it was say out in the desert in Pueblo where we were doing this for real uh, there you're dealing with dry desert sand conditions and you really got to go deep and you got to use a boatload of water to get your, uh, your resistance down. Again, I'm just going to say it one more time. Don't leave this hooked up once you're starting to move product. And don't touch the lead when it's turned on. Leave it turned off and don't touch it.